This conference will now be recorded. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to a fresh new session on credit risk modeling. And uh, before we, so as we had discussed, you know, our key focus over here would be on model, uh, so would be on the credit risk side of things, right? And while we talk about credit risk, uh, our focus over here would be on, so while, while I talk about risk over here, my focus would all, would be mostly around banking risk, right? So I'll start from the scratch and uh, we'll start off with basic discussions around banking risk. What are the risks uh, that is there? What are the, what are the, uh, so what are the, what are the, the sources of risk which is there? And we'll start off with, uh, you know, we'll start off with, uh, the key type of risks that banks are subjected to. But before we uh, talk about the different kinds of risk, the first point that we need to talk about is what is risk, right? And how does risk emanate from the banking system? So before uh, to, to talk about, before you know, we kind of talk about that, let's first try to understand how exactly uh, does this system operate right how how exactly is it that this uh, the the uh, a typical economic uh, framework is set up and from there we try to understand what are the key functions that a bank performs and resultantly how does the bank go about earning these or of uh, generating these risks right so so you know, so, so so just to start off with, uh, every economy or any 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 economy that you talk about. So let me just generically talk about any any economy, right? An economy is characterized by two broad sectors, right? So so it is kind of characterized with two broad sectors, and what are they? So one of the sectors that we have over here are the household sectors. The household sector. The other set of sector that I have over here is the business sector. What you have is a business sector. Business sector. Now, when I talk about the household sector and I talk about the business sector, basically the question that comes out over here is so so what does this household sector have what does this household sector do so the household sector sells their services their services. Sells their services. And in return for their services, what they get are wage payments so what they get are wage payments right or as we and these wage payments are nothing but this is their income which they have earned.
ओके so they get the wage payments right now this wage payments as we can see has two parts number 1 is consumption so when they spent it for their consumption purposes so i'll not use the term consumption purposes and use the word consumption expenditures wage payments so one on one side we have the wage payments so we have the consumption expenditures and the second that i have over here is savings right so this is what the household sector does right so the households in the household sector so you have that they are the ones who are selling their services right and they once they have sold of their services they get the wage payments in terms of that and there is a consumption expenditure and savings right okay now these savings would obviously go into a bank right so basically these savings are nothing but sources of funds for the bank so these savings are nothing but the sources of funds for the bank sources of funds for the banks so or rather let's put it at these are sources of funds because these are the deposits for the bank right so this is how household sector operates now let's have a look into the business sector right so what the business sector does is on one hand the business sector takes or purchases the the services of the of the household sector and it pays out the wages of the so it has the wage payments go out of the
Right. So over here, I have two parts. So one on the one hand side, I have the one who sells the household sector are selling their services to the business sector and the business sector is making a paying out the wages, right? And in between this, what the business sector do is the difference of this the business sector makes a profit. Makes a profit. Now, when the business sector is making a profit, right? So it means that that it would attract further investments and so on. However, it is not always necessary that our that you know in a business sector there would be someone who would try to you know so so in the business sector there would not be someone who would try to uh, to use its own resources and thereby and there was someone who try to do that you know use their own resources and generate the profits however at times the business sector falls short of funds so there are shortage of funds which arises in the business sector and they need ways to finance that now why is there a shortage of funds because there there is a great amount of work coming in which requires investments and maybe the business does not have that amount of investment at this point of time so they have to approach the bank for some amount of money so that they can actually work out the process, right? So, so that they can carry out their ventures. So when I talk about this, so, so that means there has to be a source from where the borrower can, you know, kind of take money from the bank and return back the money to them with interest after their profit is realized, right? So that's, so that is what the idea of so that is what the idea of the banking loans are right so so business sectors are always characterized by the shortage of funds there are certain shortage of funds now these shortage of funds provide or they finally come out to be the demand for funds the demand for the funds Okay, so this is a demand of funds. Okay, so I have the demand for funds. So from the household sector, you can see that I have the sources of the funds, that is the deposits. And over here, through the shortage of funds, or through this part, I have the demand for funds. So I have two parts. One are the sources of funds, and the second is the demand for funds. And the fact that both these two exist in the economy shows that the funds are not optimized optimally across the market right and as a result that needs to be corrected 
Now, if that has to be corrected, then we need to find out a way to solve this problem, right? So basically, what 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 do you need to do is I would calculate the expected. I, I would look into the excess demand, the expected excess demand, and from there we can find out a way of, you know, moving from the the excess demand to the excess supply side. So over here I have the demand for the funds and I have the supply of the funds. Now there has to be an arbitrator or there has to be a, a interactor which would who, who would want to to do this. So there has to be a mechanism, right? Now this mechanism is performed by the banks. The banks facilitate the inflow and the outflow of so, so the banks would help them facilitate this demand and supply of the funds, right? Okay. So you may just well go through this uh, diagram for a minute. I'll just be. This conference will now be recorded. Okay. So as I was saying that when you have a shortage of, so with the business sector having a shortage of funds and the household sectors having a surplus of funds, so therefore you, there is needed also a, a, a body or an institution needed which would help them channelize these funds efficiently because without the efficient channelization of funds these uh, would not uh, you know so this would not be uh, uh, i mean these movement of the funds would not really be very optimal right so over here let's have a so this is where you know the role of the banking system comes into play The role of the banking system comes into view. This is the banking system. Now, with the banking system in place, we have the savings being uh, put into the banks by the household sector. And this going out to the business sector in the form of a fund. Right. Similarly, this would come in and so basically what would happen is that a certain principal plus interest comes in on the fund which has been lent out to the bank, right? And what the bank does is the bank pays the interest amount to the to the depositors right now in between what the bank does is the bank arbitrages on the rate of interest right so what it does is it 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 lends out at a higher rate of interest so this lends out at a higher rate of interest
so lends out at a higher rate of interest And over here, pays a lower Okay, so it pays a lower rate of interest. Right, so over here, well, the first thing that I see over here is that it lends out at a higher rate of interest and it pays a lower rate of interest on deposits. Now, this is where the bank earns its income. Right, so this is where in between so the differential is the bank earns interest into. So this is here where the entire income of the bank comes from or majority or substantial part of the income comes in for a traditional bank bank earns a maximum of So bang on so So the bank earns an interest in
to the bank arms and interest income. Right. Now, when the bank earns an interest income, right? So over here, what we need to understand is that so when the bank is earning this income, this income adds to the cash flow of the bank, right? So it adds to the cash flow of the bank. And when it adds to the cash flow of the bank, so there are a, some, so there are certain points which needs to be taken care of. That what if, if the cash flow of the bank, so what if, if the interest payments get deferred, if the borrowers do not pay the loan in time, then what will happen? So under each of these cases, the bank's net income will get affected. And also what will happen is that this cash flow of the bank will get impacted, right? So therefore, this, so therefore in this banking system, right, the risk will arise when, when an event occurs which impacts the cash flow of the bank. So if the cash flows of the banks get affected and changes, then that element is said to have sufficient amount of risk or, or that is called a risk to the banking system. So a risk to a banking system will ensure that 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 uh, so a, a risk a risk is said to exist in the banking system if if uh, there are stochasticities in the cash flow of the bank. Right. So that is precisely what the idea of risk is. So risk is all about impairment. Now, if the credit card kind of uh, yeah, so 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 especially so let's say the credit that we have over there in this particular example, right, had been uh, had been judiciously given to people other than. I mean, who are less likely to be defaulters compared to people who are more prone to be defaulters, right? So that's basically the objective of this uh, flow diagram. So what we need to do over here is when we are studying these uh, these uh, basic guidelines and, and then all these models are taken there, right? So there are a few important things that we should keep in mind. That So there are a few points uh, which uh, we should keep in mind, right? So, so that uh, so that we can try to examine the sources from where this is arises. How exactly is it that the model development team is kind of trying to hit the sources of this, right? So that's the part that we will be looking next right so basically what we want to do over here is that so so the next part that i'll be talking about is a basic mathematical algorithm and i'll be showing it to you how it is how it is so 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 now the next question that comes out over here is that if there is this risk, how is it that we will model this risk? How can we model this risk mathematically? How can risk be modeled or represented in a mathematical framework? So we do that using the, the concept of probability, right? Okay, so before we move on, just have a quick look into this graph into this flow chart and then I'll start talking about risk, uncertainty and the role of probability in that. So we'll have a very small discussion around that. Then from there we'll move on to talk about the key sources of banking risk.
So just have a look through this diagram for a minute and then we can. Okay, so the next one that we talk about over here is that how exactly is it that this risk has to be managed, right? So basically, in the risk actually emanates if uh, if the borrower to whom the borrower to whom the bank has lent, so if the borrowers do not return bank the funds, right? So that is where this would arise, right? So that is where this problem would happen. So, so we need to, and, and, and this risk therefore is defined as the stochasticity of the cash flows of the bank. So the events which create the stochastic or which result in a stochasticity of the cash flows is something which we need to assess, right? So that's obviously one. Now let us try to uh, understand how exactly is it that we would model this risk, right? So basically, risk is defined as a set of, as a state of, uh, you know, as a set of states, right? Where each of the state has a certain probability of their occurrences, right? So let's say there are uh, two states. So so let's say uh, let's think about it this way. Let's think about it this way. Okay. So let's say when the when the bank lends out the funds, the bank lends out the funds. Uh, uh, bank lends out a hundred rupees. The principal is rupees hundred. And the rate of interest is five percent. Okay, the P is 100 and the rate of interest is 5%, right? Now, there are two things. Now, there are two possibilities. First possibility is your state one. Is state one. It is the no default possibility. The first what I have is state one. Okay. So 
over here what I have is state 0, 1. So this is the no default state. So state zero one is this, and then what we have is a no, no default state. Now in the no default state, what would happen? So what would be the cash flow of the bank? The cash flow of the bank will be a hundred rupees, right? So it would be pi. Or the profit over here is the principal is hundred and the principal plus the interest amount is 105. So the, the payoff that the bank receives is 105 minus 100. So that is rupees five. Now let's say the default state. So in the default state, we assume that, that none of the assets are, so none of the assets are there, I mean, uh, none of the assets are there in the sense that the borrower has been a default. Right, so state zero to so this is a this is a default, right? Now when you have defaulters, so the return is zero and the amount lent is hundred. So the payoff at this stage in case of a default and the borrower doesn't pay back the money is minus hundred. Now if I have this case, so now if I see this that okay. The node at the no default state pi is five and at a default stage it is the pi is minus hundred. So then what we have over here is that I have these two payoffs and corresponding to each of these two payoffs, there is an assigned probability. So this is probability of state zero one and obviously which belongs to zero comma one. And this is probability zero two. Which belongs again to zero comma one such that zero two is one minus. Such that. P02 is equal to 1 minus P01. Right, so such that P02 is equal to 1 minus P01. Right, so this is something that we have over here. So observe that, that the cash flow that the bank has is contingent on the state that it occurs, right? So therefore, therefore this probability distribution over the set of outcomes which is there is known as the, so, so, so that is known as the risk. So, in other words, if I have to rephrase this in a very simple manner, right? I would define this risk as I would define the risk as a probability distribution.
So <clears throat> a probability distribution over the loss outcomes. So over the it's four o'clock. Over the possible values of the losses. Right. So over here, if you see that 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 in the step one, it is no default state. It is pi is hundred pi minus hundred. That's pi. So basically, the loss over there is minus pi. Whereas in the second case, the default the default state, the loss is full of minus hundred. So and to each of these probabilities, there is a uh, so each of these outcome there is a probability associated with it. Therefore, the next thing that comes out over here is that there is a, a probability distribution over the possible outcomes. Right, so over the uh, possible loss outcomes. So basically, what I'm trying to do over here is I'm trying to understand. So the, the, the risk over here is that what, how likely uh, for me is it to earn so and so loss values? Okay, so if there is a such, so, so better the borrower is, lower are the chances of the losses, and whenever the profit occurs, it is a negative loss. So basically, what we are looking at, so, so at risk that the bank you know so the risk that a bank uh, is exposed to right can be captured through the loss distribution of a bank right so basically i can say that the risk that the bank is exposed to can be captured through the loss distribution of the bank risk to which risk to which a bank is exposed to the risk to which a bank is exposed to can be captured through So it is to which a bank is exposed to can be captured through the loss distribution. Right, can be captured through the loss distribution of a bank. Right. Okay, before I move on, though this part is very basic, is this part clear to us? Yes. Okay. Yes, then. Okay, thank you. Okay, now from here, the next uh, portion comes.
fine. So now the next question that comes out over here is that I have been talking about a loss distribution. Right? So before we go on to talk about anything, we need to understand how a distribution works, right? What exactly a loss distribution is. So first of all, when we talk about distributions, So when we talk about distributions, so by distributions, we essentially refer to some observed probability distributions or to some theoretical probability distributions. We're talking about distributions. So while we talk about distributions, distributions will refer to to empirical or observed distributions. Or observed distribution Empirical or observed distributions. And the second type of distributions are theoretical probability distributions. Right, so I have theoretical, so on one side I have the empirical or the observed distribution. And on the other side what I have is the theoretical probability distribution. Right. Now, the next question over here is so what is, what are these two distributions? Now, a very common concept of uh, this, you know, one very common concept of distribution is that <clears throat> that on the x-axis these distributions have the value and on the y-axis you have the relative frequency you have the frequency distributions so over here x so over here you have the variate And over here, you have the relative frequency. Okay, 
so over here so if it is an observed distribution right the y axis will contain the relative frequency distribution right and if it is a theoretical distribution this y axis will contain the uh, probability figures right so so let's say there is a distribution like this so basically what it maps over here is it maps the So like this, right? So like this, I have the distribution. Now this distribution is a observed distribution or an empirical distribution, right? So why am I calling it an empirical distribution? I am calling this an empirical distribution because on the y-axis, what I have is the relative frequency distribution. right so why is it that this is known as the so why is the relative frequency what is the relative frequency indicative of the relative frequency is indicative of the observed probability of a certain value to occur in a given distribution right so so if it's the so if the y axis has the relative frequencies then it's called an empirical uh, distribution or the observed distribution so while i talk about this relative frequency distribution i think we must look into some of the points over here and that point over here is the as follows so before we move on just let me clarify the concept of what what i mean by a relative frequency right so let's say there is a value x Okay, so F1 is the frequency of so X1, F1 is the frequency of X1, F2 is the frequency of X2, and similarly, like this, Fn is the frequency of Xn. Right? So this is what I have obtained. Now, on the other hand, uh I want to compute the relative frequency distribution. So the question that comes out over here is, how do I calculate this relative frequency distribution? So over here, uh, the, 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 the fundamentals calculated are very simple. 
So what we have over here is we have the n, n is the total number of observations. N is equal to F1. plus F2 plus Fn. So this is, this N is nothing but the total number of observations. <clears throat> okay. So over here, what I have is if one by n. So F1 is the total number of cases or the frequency of X1 to occur. So it is the total number of cases which is favorable to the occurrence of F X1, right? Divided by the total number of occurrence. So this is nothing but the observed probability of X1 to occur. Probability of X1 to occur. The next that I have over here is F2 by N, which is the observed probability of X2 to occur. Like this, I have if N by N, which is the, the observed probability of X N to occur. Now, if I do this, so if I am doing this, what am I actually doing? There? So I am just plotting the, the relative frequencies on the Y axis and the values on the X axis and that that is giving me the, the the distribution. So in a distribution on the axis, you are what you are actually plotting is the relative frequency or a measure of probability. And on the x-axis, you are plotting your the values of your variable. And it shows that how exactly is it that the values are distributed, or how frequently is the value are the values like to occur in the given distribution. Right. Right, so this is how we are kind of working. So is this part clear to us? Uh, any, any, any questions up to this point? So the uh, the observed distribution, I mean, they are, uh, I mean, they are asymptotic or they can touch like zero. No, they will ideally be asymptotic because okay. they will not be touching zero. Because if the frequency of a value touches zero, then it means the value does not occur in the series, right? Mm. So let's say X n occurs one time, okay. And the total number is 10,000. So one by 10, so X n will have a probability of one by 10,000, right? But if X n's frequency is zero, what, what it means is that X n is not a part of the variable, right, of the variable, uh, of, the, of the variable values. So therefore, it will automatically kind of go outside the distribution value. So for a value to be included into the distribution, the frequency at least has to be one or greater than one, right? So therefore, 
a probability of uh, of the relative frequency can tend to zero but it will never touch zero right So, Vishal, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So therefore, the reason behind, uh, you know, talking about this concept of a distribution is that a very important concept in about in, uh, in this domain of credit risk or whatever we are going to study on this side of regulatory risk is the concept of a bank's loss distribution. concept of a bank's loss distribution. Right. So as they talk about loss distribution, right? So the first question which comes out to me over here is that how do I uh, characterize this loss distribution? How does this loss distribution look like? So that's the part that we should be talking about. Okay. So let me write this. The loss distribution. Now, when you look into the losses, right? So there are always two kinds of losses that a bank is always exposed to. One of the set of loss is the expected loss, which is mostly the portfolio loss which arises from the the portfolio or from the from the the bank's uh, transaction behavior okay <clears throat> So for expected losses are those losses which arises from the portfolio transaction of the bank, from the from the bank's portfolio, uh, from the portfolio behavior of the bank, right? And and unexpected losses are those losses which.
So an unexpected losses are those losses which are not within the portfolio behavior of the bond, right? So it is outside, it lies outside the, the behavior of the bond, right? So it lies outside the, the purview of portfolio portfolio losses, right? So so these are these do not arise from the bank's risk management strategy. So let's say suddenly there is a war or there is a, a, a depression or, or, or a recession which breaks out. So in such cases, it is not within the bank's risk management strategies to handle such losses. Those during those situations, it is absolutely imperative that the bank waits and counts on to uh, the, the bank absorb those losses using capital and stuff, but but those losses are outside the purview of the bank's risk management strategy. So these are unexpected losses, right? So the, so so with an increase, with sudden shocks hitting the macroeconomic system, these unexpected losses can get triggered. Therefore, the key role that you need to play in this exercise is to ensure that that yes, this is something that we would like to play. So this is something that we would, uh, you know, so this is something that we may be, uh, we may be uh, facing or things like that. So, so the in the unexpected losses, the banks are not equipped with, uh, I, I mean, the banks, uh, the unexpected losses of a bank do not arise from within the bank's risk practices. They are some extraneous or exogenous shocks which hits the banking system. However, these shocks are so critical that they, even though they occur very rarely, but they can still impact, they can actually bring huge exposure losses for the bank, and hence the bank needs to be adequately capitalized. So, one such example was the 2008 global financial crisis, right? So, that's one that is one thing which needs to be taken care of right so so while we talk about this loss distribution right so generally how would the loss distribution of a bank kind of look like So over here we have So a typical loss distribution of a bank looks like this. Right. So this distribution, if you can see, is kind of it's not very symmetric, right? So this distribution is called an asymmetric distribution or a skewed distribution. asymmetric distribution or the skewed distribution.
or a skewed distribution. So over here, what we are trying to do, we are saying that, that over here I have an asymmetric distribution or a skewed distribution. Now the question is, why is it? Or one thing you can clearly see is that the mode of this loss distribution, right, arises at this point. It arises towards the lower end of the values, right? So one thing that you know is that most of the the representative loss figures are at the lower end. I mean, at this lower end, and which is pretty understandable because a bank has its risk management strategies, right? And it would always try to ensure that its lending process is such that that the uh, so so the lending process is such that that only the uh, the uh, the risk can be minimized right so so therefore the portfolio losses comprise of the most representative yet a smaller fraction of the total losses right so the uh, the expected losses of the bank or the average loss of the bank right is identified by this right because it's a it's a right, so this distribution, if you see that most of the representative values rise, lies to the left hand side of the distribution. So the values which are not representative of the overall distribution and the values which occur very rarely distribution, uh, they lie to the right hand side. So therefore this distribution is called a right skewed distribution. So the expected loss, so this distribution, right, skewed distribution, right? Now this expected loss that I have over here is the portfolio average losses, right? So when we talk about expected losses, I'll come to talk about this, what exactly is it that I mean by the expected losses, right? So this expected loss is nothing but the long run average loss. So we'll we I will define why is it that I'm saying that this is a long run average loss. I'll I'll say I'll, I'll I'll kind of talk about that. But as of now, observe one thing that this expected loss over here is a uh, is like a data, right? So it's like long run. So this is a long run average losses. Right, so this is the expected loss and this is what the long run average loss is. Right, so when I have a look at this, when I have a look at this loss distribution, right, so I have this right skewed distribution as well. Now, from here, the next part of the distribution, so, so from here, we need to next define the unexpected loss. So the unexpected loss is nothing but it is the deviation from the average loss uh, from the expected losses so the unexpected loss arises at the tail end value so the total loss minus the expected loss will be your unexpected loss and this value is known as the potential loss a value beyond the out, uh, um, unexpected loss is known as the potential loss 
So over here, the next question that comes out over here is how do we define these losses, right? So the next part of the exercise is to explain each of these loss components. So be it the expected loss, be it the unexpected loss, or be it the potential loss. So each of these are the ones which we should be. So or each of these would be the one that we should be kind of explaining, we should be interpreting them, right? We would be having them. So that's the next part of the discussion that we would have, right? So we would next define what a potential loss is, what an expected loss is, and what an unexpected loss is. And from there, we will start moving to talk about, we go ahead and we'll talk about why, where exactly is this expected loss is required? Where exactly is this unexpected loss required? And how do they come together in, in uh, assessing the final capital uh, ratios and, and how do they flow together, right? So that's the next part of our discussion, All right? Okay, so let's take a pause here for the day. So we will regroup again tomorrow. 2 p.m. and uh, we will be discussing the next part of these concepts. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anwar.